Hey, good evening and welcome to the pandemic version of Montpelier Civic Forum. Now what the pandemic version means is that you guys have absentee ballots and hopefully you're going to cast those or show up in person on Tuesday, March 2nd for town meeting day. And we've got a whole series of these programs. We have Ann Watson talking about what the city of Montpelier looks like sitting in the mayor's seat, projects that have been pushed off, projects that are going on and projects that might not make it. We have Bill and Ann talking about the city budget. We have Jim Murphy talking about the proposed school budget. We have school board candidates. We have city council candidates. We even have a candidate for a five-year position on the Parks Commission. I have the pleasure tonight of speaking with Mia Moore, who is a sitting member of the Montpelier Roxbury School Board. I almost said the Montpelier <laughs> School Board. Mia. How long have you been on the board? Um, about three months, four months maybe. I started in mid-November. So of last you've year. never you've never attended a board meeting that hasn't been Zoom. Uh, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I was attending several of them last year as a community member, um, but even those were all via Zoom. Mm -hmm. When you said to the rest of your family. I want to be on the school board. What was the reaction in the family? Or didn't they know how much time would be devoted to the school board? Oh, um, the reaction was very positive. Because um, they didn't know how much time would be involved. No, we had a, a fairly good idea, um, a fairly good idea of that. Uh, but I think um, my husband saw how important it was to me to, to serve in this capacity, and he said we would figure out how to make it work. And um, you have figured out to some degree how yeah, to make it work. more or less, certainly. You have children in the district. We do. Um, we have uh, three kiddos. William is nine, and he's in third grade. Oliver is six, and he's in first grade. And Louisa is four, and she's in preschool. So you're all union. Uh, our preschooler is at a, a daycare facility uh, that is Soon a part of the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, she'll, go, she'll start kindergarten, not this coming fall, but the next fall. Your two boys, they are old enough to have gone to Union before the pandemic. Yes, Oliver was in kindergarten last year, and um, that was really rough when the pandemic hit. Um, he was, uh, it was just very sad for all of us because he so enjoyed his classroom, his teachers, his friends, and... As you know, we thought that the, um, the closure was temporary at first. And um, I can remember the day that I learned that it wasn't and was very, very sad about that, about not, him not being able to return to that environment. Um, and felt the same way for William, who was in second grade last year. Um, just both of them were really um, enriched in their environment, particularly they, they both had really spectacular teachers and those teachers did the very best they could to transition to being online last spring um, but it was certainly nowhere near what they were getting in their in their classrooms and and that's one of the reasons that I was and continue to be so incredibly grateful to the 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 heroic effort that our teachers are putting in, in every single day and the leadership of our administration that they that they showed over the course of this summer to to put their um, eyes on a goal of having our kids back in school knowing just how critical that was for for their education and their development and really making it happen uh, it, it, my gratitude is is overwhelming now I assume that either you or your husband was transitioning to a Zoom environment for your work. Um, I already was in a fairly uh, Zoom-heavy environment. I work for myself as a, as a coach and a consultant on organizational development and, and management um, issues through an equity lens. And so much of the work that I was doing with clients was already uh, virtual and over Zoom or phone calls. But I had a fairly am a good amount of it where I got to meet up with people in real life. Um, his work was much more in an office and with his team in person, three-dimensionally. Um, so yes, it was a big shift for our whole family, for both of us to be primarily and almost 100% um, working from home. Uh, but uh, 
Ultimately, though, we are incredibly grateful for the ability to do it. Now, you said you were attending meetings, uh, mm -hmm. which means that you must have contact with other parents. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, work, I, I talk with other parents uh, all the time. Some of those parents, now we're going to flash forward to this school year, mm -hmm. Your children are, are at Union this year, or are they at home doing the virtual? They're at Union. Mm -hmm. What is the experience like, and can you explain to the audience what a pod is? Um, sure. The experience is fantastic uh, from our perspective, and that's one of the things that I, um, and that, that rests on, I really believe, the heroic effort that the teachers are doing every single day to, um, to, to be in classrooms with, with kids. Now that's two teachers in an individual classroom. There are two teachers in an individual classroom, and in some cases, they also have an instruct uh, a, a um, instructional assistant or another uh, adult support person. Um, so in in Oliver's classroom, in fact, they actually have three teachers. And the way that it works is that there is very little, almost no interaction with any other teacher or human being in the building. Is for the, the class is the, the euphemism teachers. for the classroom a pod or is a pod different than a classroom? Um, no, I think they're pretty much interchangeable. Yes, they are in a pod with the the students and teachers who are in their classroom. As a parent, how uh, do you take their temperature before school and yes. then write it down on a piece of paper and submit that? Yes, we have a list of um, of items we need to go through each morning as a family for both of our kids to ensure that they are, as best we can tell, COVID free before they go into school. And that's, um, uh, the school has called it the golden ticket. Every kiddo brings one of those in, signed by a parent. Um, and that is to, and it addresses the, the basic um, symptoms or uh, um, activities that may uh, make you make it seem like you might have uh, a, have uh, the coronavirus. But, you know, if you check all those boxes, you're effectively saying, to the best of my ability, uh, I don't believe that we do, and so my child is free and clear to go to school today. Are your children within walking distance of Union? Do they ride the school bus? Do you drive them? Uh, we drive them each day. We're a little over a mile from the school, so for, at their age, it's a little young to, for them to walk to and from school. And they were riding the bus last year, but we decided that in order to maintain the, um, the integrity of their classroom pod, um, and because we have the flexibility in our schedule, which I know not all parents do, we would be able to drive them to school instead of relying on the bus. Do parents feel comfortable on the bus having kids, their kids on the bus? Um, I have friends who have kids on the bus and they do feel comfortable. Um, and they have instituted same kind of regulations like social distancing and ventilation on the bus. Obviously masks are worn. Um, and so uh, that, has been, um, that has been working certainly all school year so far. Your friends who are not in school, whose children are not in school, what is their experience like? Have you spoken to people whose children are virtual? You know, I've only gotten a little tiny glimpse of it. Uh, one of the the um, one of the very big downfalls of this pandemic that we're in is that I feel like we are less and less connected to each other in general. Um, and so those those friends who have kids in, um, attending virtually and um, teachers who are friends of mine who are teaching virtually. I just see less of them and we talk less and connect less. Uh, so I don't have a full understanding um, of what their experience is. Um, what I have seen, I can see that it's tough. Um, and, uh, and I really applaud them and uh, know that our district is doing what we can to support them um, in, in making the most of, uh, of being able to, to, to learn virtually. Now, you were on the board after the decisions were made to have a discreet, I am in the school or I am not in the school. Some districts, a lot of districts have chosen three days, two days, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Were you following that as, as a community member? Um, yes, a little bit. Certainly, certainly as an interested parent. <laughs> um, I uh, didn't 
um, follow it very closely, but when I was, as soon as I learned that there would be a real effort being made to make five-day in-person learning possible, um, I was incredibly grateful to, to hear that that effort was being made, and of course that they've, we've pulled it off. Um, and I also think it is remarkable and generous and necessarily so um, that the district has been able to offer both in-person and virtual based on the needs of, uh, and then families can make that decision based on their own needs. Now you've been on the board now for three months, mm -hmm. so you have the opportunity to hear from parents who are, are uncertain about their path. Mm. Um, a decision was made that it would be difficult for kids to say, hey, I'm not happy at home, I wanna come in. Mm -hmm. Or kids, I'm not happy at school, I wanna go back home as mm -hmm. I had it last year. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing from parents on that choice? No, we're not. Mm -mm. What are you hearing as a board member from parents on this? On specifically on the, on, the in-person experience, and, yeah. The, yeah. We hear overwhelmingly that parents who are, are very happy to have been able to make the choice themselves and the parents that have chosen to have their kids in school are incredibly grateful and, and glad that it's working. Are you hearing anything from Roxbury parents? Um, we have not received any official you know, public comment or emails or no, so no, I haven't really heard um, from Roxbury parents. Now, the kids academically, there's been, a, and we're, we're getting into equity now, we've had a, an achievement gap. For as long as I've done these shows, and it's been many, many years, mm -hmm. every year the school board members speak about the achievement gap and how they want to narrow the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. Now I assume, and I think it's a reasonable assumption, that middle class, the children of the middle class last year had a little difficult but were able to negotiate and ride perhaps even better because the parents were so close to, to their academic that they weren't before when they were in school. Mm. But for low income kids where you had just such stressors, including their parents being unemployed perhaps, and the pandemic pressure, you name the pressure. Yeah. An, an inability been, of their work being flexible for them to even be home. Many, absolutely. Many people not being able to work from home. Mm -hmm. So you've got perhaps backsliding. Mm -hmm. What do we do? How do if, if we were here and had this gap, mm. am I correct in assuming that the gap might have gone like this? Well, it's... It's something that, that's a hypothesis that we do need to test against. Um, right now, what we're hearing is that there, um, the data that the that the teachers are drawing in is finding that we did not have much backsliding in general. Um, the spring didn't have a terrible impact, certainly. While it was an incredible challenge for everyone who was involved in it, it didn't have a terrible impact on the learning of our students. Um, now. I think it is fair to question how did kids who have um, more obstacles in front of them, whether they be socioeconomic or racial or a language barrier, how or, did or they- Or a disability. Or, or, um, or a disability. How did they fare in that time period and, and in comparison to where their peers, how their peers, peers did or how they, and, and how, what's how that, how is that playing out right now? That's definitely a question to examine, and, and I think the, the best way to do is to, to dig into actual data uh, to see what, how are they performing? What, um, what supports do they have? What supports did we put in place for them? And it is still fairly early to be able to answer all of that conclusively, um, but one thing that, um, that I know is that our administration and our teachers really are paying very close attention to it. Were we able to close the connectivity gap I couldn't say for sure whether or not. I know that the district was working very hard on ensuring that the technology, that students maybe who didn't have their own computer or their own kind of actual technology at home, they, they ensured that everyone could have a, a piece of technology that could help them be connected. Now the district didn't really have much that, that we could do as far as um, the, you know, the actual connectivity. Um, and so I don't, I couldn't say conclusively whether or not uh, every single student was able to connect online. That's an impossible question to ask. But as a parent, um, I remember my son living on that second floor of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Mm. 
And I'm, I'm sure that you know, a number of, of our children live around that, that library after mm -hmm. school and on the weekends with the library closed. Is that a significant problem for parents? That's a great question, and I, I mourn the loss of the library as a gathering space myself. There are many times where I've driven past um, that beautiful building and just really longed to be able to go in. Um, it, was a, it was definitely a space that, as when my children are even younger, um, I uh, treated as, a, as an outing <laughs> to be able to get to that second floor and play with the toys and pick any book off the shelf that we wanted to. Um, so I, yeah, I, that is a big, big, big hole right now. But you did mention that it's one of the gathering places for the community, mm -hmm. that the entire community looks to the Kellogg Hubbard as a place of social gathering. Mm -hmm. And it's closed, or mm -hmm. not even closed, it's just scaled back so far. Right. Uh, especially from being a social gathering spot. Yeah. It's, really unfortunate. I look forward to the day when they can open their doors wider. What is the board doing in the last couple of meetings? Now we're speaking in February. Mm -hmm. what, were, what was the board discussing in January? Um, a really big uh, topic was the budget um, because the, board's, the board has three main duties uh, and, and the fiduciary responsibility of establishing a proposed budget to the, um, to the town for, for voting on town meeting day is uh, one of the big three. And um, the other two are um, hiring and evaluation of the superintendent and, the, uh, and pol setting policy. Uh, so policy in January- Policy in one sense, please. Well, um, literally writing policies that the district will then follow. So one example of a policy that we have on the books is the one that was um, established following um, some incredible leadership and advocacy by our high school students um, back in 2019, I wanna say. We passed policy F22, the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. And it's the board that writes and passes that policy, and then it's the administration and the, the staff and the teachers who are in charge of um, enacting the, the, the duties that go along with that policy. Back in the 2019, what was the problem that Montpelier High School students were seeing that, that caused them to collectively, at least a group of them, gather together to try and advocate for change? Um, I think to sum it up, they were saying the experiences that they were having at school were in, were inequitable. They were not, um, uh, students were experiencing racism at school. They were experiencing um, being uh, um, put in positions of needing to defend their own identities. And they wanted to see there being more support uh, in place for essentially being able to find school to be a welcoming and accessible place. Um, and they were, um, I think, incredibly courageous in coming forward and sharing their stories to say, these are big problems that will not only serve us and help us, but will serve every single student when we begin to address them. This sounds reminiscent of when our son was in school, uh, the Gay Straight Club, mm -hmm. and the attempt to address that issue. That was years, years prior, but mm -hmm. is this building off of that sort of awareness? I think um, social justice movements are deeply in connect interconnected. Um, and so people who are raising an awareness around one issue, it, you can definitely draw um, some pretty clear lines between um, harassment around, uh, around uh, gender identity or sexual orientation or uh, or race or other uh, ethnicities and, and language barriers. And that's why um, I agree with the students when they say, was, when we begin to really address these, under, these, these, these problems that we are facing and things that we are experiencing on a very personal level, it doesn't just make the situation better for me, it makes it better for all students. We're to the issue that we're speaking of on the city side when we're talking about defunding police, you know, and, and we're talking about issues that transcend Montpelier, they transcend Vermont, they're national issues. Mm -hmm. 
Are you speaking basically about a national issue as it relates to lo the localization at Montpelier High School? Um, I think it's really important to understand that Vermont is no exception to what is happening at the national scale. Um, and that we, there are, I, I'm guilty of this myself in a number of ways of saying, well, my experience right now is actually pretty darn good. Um, my children and I find Union Elementary School to be incredibly welcoming. It feels cozy when you walk in the building. And that doesn't mean that it's that way for every single person who enters the building. And that's repeated at the middle school, at Roxbury, at the high school. And um, so I think it's really important to understand that just because our perspective is one of, um, of abundance and welcoming and warmth and, um, and positivity doesn't mean that's the case for everyone else. And I think that's one of the traps that we fall into when we, when we try and say, uh, say, well, those are issues that are happening at the national level, but here in Vermont, we're, we're special, um, when in, in, re in the reality is we're not. Haven't children always, one group or another, always been marginalized in high school to some degree? Isn't that a terrible thing? Right. I, I'm just asking. <laughs> uh, even in my day, the long, long ago, there were, there were groups that were marginalized. And that was not good then. It's not good now. But is this something that, that has a rich tradition? Sociologically, is, is this something that, that's prone to happen in, in social organisms? Well, I think that's a fair question. And then it's worth um, examining how do we equip students and teachers and staff for working their way through those things. No one should... Through those things or beyond those things? I think through in order to get beyond. Um, and what I'm thinking about is how are we equipping students for life outside of school? Certainly, it, even if they're not being marginalized or picked on in high school, they need to know how to resolve conflict in in solution-oriented ways, ways that where they are standing up for themselves but still demonstrating respect for others. Um, and I think there's a lot that can be done to help prepare students for life after their education within our district um, around things like um, conflict resolution and, uh, and, and being solution-oriented. And doing that through a lens of when someone is of an identity that has been long oppressed in our country, um, what it, being taking great care at what their experience is and the historical um, uh, challenges that they have faced because of it. Is that a pre-K through 12 curriculum? I know that the district is working on what they what what sort of in education is termed um, social emotional behavioral learning, um, and it gets woven into uh, into from pre K all the way through twelfth grade. I think there's a, a long way that we have to go to ensure that there are um, standards set that are district wide, um, and we we take a systems wide approach to this. It's one of the things that I really appreciate about. Libby Bonesteel, our superintendent, is that she um, has a big focus on ensuring that we have a systems-wide approach, that it's not just like, you know, one teacher is amazing, let's help figure out how all teachers can be amazing. Um, and I think that that kind of approach um, can be, and we are working toward having that in social, emotional, behavioral learning as well as establishing standards and a systems-wide approach for, um, for ensuring that, that students graduate from our district um, with really strong uh, social, emotional, and behavioral skills. What's the metric on that? You, you can't standardize test that. No. You're not going to sit and ask four different questions and say, okay, which one is, is the most appropriate? That's something that I think we're still working on, it's figuring out what does success look like and how do we measure against it. Mm -hmm. Will you ever be successful? Or is it a, is it a standard that that can never really be met. Well, one of the things that I really love about our district is that we are, in our mission, actually, um, state that we are working on um, creating lifelong learners, lifelong lovers of learning. Um, and I think this is one great example of how, no, no one's ever going to be perfect at conf conflict resolution, but what are some of the basic skills and tools that we can equip ourselves with 
to, um, to ensure that we can continue working on it and learning it um, when, when beyond our classroom walls. Do the students who, in 2019, they're still in, in Montpelier, some of them some are of them. Still, still in high school. Are they seeing the progress? Are they recognize it? recognizing it? Are they giving feedback that things appear to be moving in a direction that, that they feel is adequate? Probably not fast enough for them, but sure. their kids. Um, we have not heard direct feedback from students on progress. Um, so that would be, uh, that's a hard question for me to answer. Has there been any pushback on this? On what specifically? On, on, on conflict resolution for equity purposes? Is, has there been anyone saying, hey, this doesn't feel right, all, all people are important, you know, that, that sort of argument? No, we really haven't gotten that. Mm -mm. Did you anticipate getting that? Um, I can't really say. How much of this is, in, is income based, is, is a sense of, of l lower income versus moderate and higher income? How much of, of that dissonance hmm. is, is a clash of, of class? Um, well, I think that that's very real. Uh, I, it would be very difficult for me to put a number to it no, or no, a percentage, no, no, not but at all. I do, that's, that certainly is real. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deal with that? I think it's very similar to um, to dealing with any difference. Um, is actually leaning in and celebrating differences, and it, as a te teaching kids to lean in and celebrate each other's differences and what makes us unique. And then as educators, digging beneath the surface and saying, what could really be? What's going on with this kiddo? What's 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 leading to this challenge? Um, and our educators are really doing an excellent job at that. You were on the board for the discussion of the school resource officer. That's right. And what should happen with that position. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, how did that go? And what was, what was the problem with having a school resource officer? What did the board see, not, not yourself, but what did the board see right. as a problem with that? Right. Well, um, I, I was actually involved in that question before joining the board. Um, that was the main reason for me that I chose to attend school board meetings over the course of the summer was to be part of the conversation about the school resource officer. And um, I also had a chance, had the opportunity to serve on the uh, school safety and police relations committee and still am serving on that committee. And um, I think the main thing that it, that it has come down to is that well, there were many positive things that our um, SRO brought to the role. Um, at the end of the day, the very presence of an armed police officer in our schools was a barrier to education for some students, and that we can't have that. Uh, did you guys approach uh, Police Chief Pete to get rid of the arm and to get rid of the armor of, of the bulletproof vest? It was that one of the committees and I or one of the questions that the committee asked and I do want to give a lot of um, uh, kudos to this committee of um, community members, a city council member, um, representative from the police force, two school board members and, and a teacher and a guidance counselor couple of administrators from the schools, and most importantly, three students from the schools. So it's a fairly sizable committee. There are, I think, 13 of us on this committee doing an incredible amount of work to really dig into this issue and see what are the different angles from which we can approach it, what are some of the solutions that we can, can find. And in fact, that was one specific question we asked Chief Pete, and the answer was no, the, the officer cannot be at school unarmed. Um, and that's, a f and that's, that's fair. For the and that seemed like a bottom line dif difference. Yeah. Do you feel that the district is prepared for the doomsday of, of, a, um, of a school shooter? I mean, the school resource officer was the front face of that plan. Well, the thing that's very interesting about that is that Chief Pete himself said a doomsday scenario, the worst case scenario, our greatest fear is not a reason to have a school resource officer because there are three schools that the, that the SRO was tasked with covering. The SRO actually doesn't cover the Roxbury um, Village School because Roxbury um, uses and contracts with the state police. 
but there are three schools. It was a numbers game. If the, if the school resource officer would have been on the scene even, if that were ever to occur. And in fact, one of the things that the committee did also was dig into studies that demonstrated school resource officers are not the solution to preventing school shootings or to preventing more death in school shootings. Your committee is still ongoing? Yes. What is it studying now? Right now we're um, working on, so what does it look like? What does true justice and, um, and discipline and, um, and, and holistic safety, so including social and emotional behavioral learning, look like in our district through the ends of, lens of our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, um, through the lens of what does safety look like, um, what is our vision for safety, uh, so now we're getting a little bit just more specific about that. How do we show up with each other in ways that are truly supportive of safety and um, our real social, emotional, and behavioral learning needs? Do you have a timeline as to when the next recommendations might come out? Yes, end of March, early April. So we have a lot of work to do in a short period of time. Mia, I want to thank you so very much for being with us. and. Thank equity you for having is, me, Richard. Equity is, is an interesting issue. I'm glad that we were able to probe it at some depth. Yes, yeah. Lots more to talk about, but um, thank you very much for the conversation and the opportunity. And I want to thank you for watching the show tonight and urge you to watch the other ORCA shows, including the two budget shows. Anne's presentation as mayor, which is really interesting. The other candidates. And make sure you get out and vote. It's so important whether you vote by absentee or actually go out there on Tuesday and get out to vote. Please do so and make sure your friends do as well. Thank you so very much.